Welcome to Plugged Inland. I'm Roger Bowman. Folks, this is going to be a great show. You'll want to get to the phone or get ready to email questions in on this one. In 2007, this nation felt the impact of a housing bubble burst that decimated our region. Jobs evaporated and foreclosure signs began dotting every neighborhood. This station ran a series of 16 episodes on the crisis, with guests helping to advise callers on how or when to save their homes and when to walk away. Tonight, we look at where we've come in the intervening six years. So let's take a quick glimpse at a few scenes from those prior shows. My disclaimer to you is that we pulled these off of YouTube, so you just have to roll with the lower quality. It'll be worth it. But they highlight loan mods, financial literacy, 211 services for those who have lost their homes, predatory lending suits, modification fraud, and tenants' rights when your home has been sold out from under you and you're the tenant. Let's take a look. My name is Jason Yancey. I'm the operations manager for the Mortgage Crisis Department. Uh, basically, through Hope Coalition America, uh, we saw the need for foreclosure prevention. So we have a few call centers, and we assist homeowners through general guidance and assistance to walking them through whatever options they may have if they're interested in retaining their property. For whatever reason, they've come with some hardship and, and can't make the payments then if they're looking for a modification, we walk them through that and assist them directly with contacting the lender, going through the lender's uh, red tape process and filling out paperwork and submitting it for the homeowner. So we started elementary school in fourth and fifth grade. And we have uh, three curriculums. We have the elementary school curriculum, middle school curriculum, and high school curriculum. But we believe uh, at the elementary school level, it's probably good to start around eight years old, eight, eight to nine years old. No kidding. And the goal of this, as I understand it then, is not only to teach financial literacy, but to help people understand how to manage their finances so as to become a stakeholder, become a homeowner, become a small business owner in those communities. Exactly. Anyone can call 211. It's a phone number. And you can call it from your cell phone or your pay phone or your landline. And we have specialists who will answer the phone, a live voice, and help them through their issues. They just say, I have a problem. And I don't know what to do, and they'll they'll interview and work with the person until they figure out all the resources that they need. Okay, so 411 charges you on your phone bill. How do you charge people? We don't. Yeah. It's a free call. It's a free call. Free it's call. toll free. Toll free. And there's no charge for the service. Not to the caller. So tell me what a typical call is. Take me through one. Well, a typical call, our first objective is to establish rapport with the caller. And the great thing about 211 is that the whole purpose of the person on the other end of the phone line is to help the caller. That's what our staffs are there for. Their objective is to find out what that caller needs and to help that caller. So they're going to establish rapport with the caller. They're going to find out what the caller's situation is. And many times, like Maribel says, the, the caller knows they have a problem, but they, don't really, they can't really say, this is my need. So our people are trained in to be able to dig through what they're telling them to find out exactly what their needs are and then using national standards and a database of resources this is the resources for San Bernardino County alone then to find the proper and appropriate resources to connect that person to. Uh, my name is Alan Sims um, I am, am uh, the CEO of the Center for Litigation and Consumer Real Estate Education it's a brand new nonprofit my background I'm a forensic real estate appraiser and with that, uh, the services we provide, it's a new service, we will be providing uh, litigation support for anyone who's been involved in predatory lending. As you can imagine, it's, it's a very big organization that we have planned. It will be up and running, hopefully within the next six to eight weeks. We need to get all our, our, our ducks in order here, but mainly what we need to get is the proper funding and recognition from the federal government. There are, there are approved credit counseling agencies out there that you can find going, if you go to the HUD.gov website, you can find an approved credit counselor in your area anywhere in the U.S. And those are, are companies that are, are legitimate nonprofit entities that will help consumers who are in financial distress in, in any situation, including being behind or, or, or underwater on your mortgage. Okay. But, but you know, it, I'm going to jump to another call. Okay, caller. go ahead. Okay, so. We're going to go out to Crestline. Leonard, uh, you're on the air. It's your call. What's your question? Yes, my Leonard? question is, uh, the property that I am renting 
is in foreclosure. <laughs> and uh, I'm not being, oops, sorry for the motorcycle. I am not being charged any rent. You're not being charged rent. No. That's unusual. Okay. So, so your question is uh, how long will that last in your favor? I, I really don't know. It, okay. So let's, how about they paint a likely outcome yeah. for you? Can you do that? Uh, I know uh, that that is I've already gone one month. That's a tough one. That's a tough one for us. I mean, I've heard um, of problems in this area of, of basically homes being taken or, or apartments being taken out from under people because they get foreclosed on because the owner of the of the property falls behind on the payments and then the lenders are foreclosing uh, and getting the tenants out. But I think the tenants do have rights. I mean, I don't think that it's just you're out the door. Got it. Joining me in studio is expert witness and author Alan Sims, a former guest who we're glad to have back. He became passionate about bank malfeasance and started a service helping homeowners in litigation sue their banks. And that's what we're going to talk about, how to sue your bank if you're the right candidate. Also joining me is PhD candidate of UC Riverside who researches the housing crisis, Isabel Placentia. Thank you both for being with us. And Thank let you, me Andrew. start. Alan, I saw the clip on there. What the heck happened to you? Uh, I started riding a bike, so I probably lost about 90 pounds in about a year and a half. <laughs> Holy cow, I'm envious. Well, All right, uh, let's get to the subject at hand. You're an expert witness. Yes. So how was the victim shot? Uh, on what we started back in 2009. <laughs> <laughs> You're ignoring it. What I, want to, what I wanted you to do is tell me what an expert witness is when it comes to loan fraud. What we really do, what I do, is I, with my experience in the, in the uh, uh, real estate business, I'm also a real estate appraiser, so you look at all the elements of a real estate transaction. And if you know these elements, then you're able to present specific abnormalities of these elements, such as a fraudulent behavior or intentional purpose. And that's what I use and what I do as an expert witness, as, especially in the loan modifications. So you actually go to court and serve as an expert witness talking about whether or not banks have acted appropriately, whether or not the applicant has acted appropriately, whether the documentation is appropriate, whether the appraisals. Dig into like, give me an example case. Uh, I'll give you an example, yes. In answer to your question, yes to all what you just asked about. An example would be, um, did the bank uh, make promises to a homeowner for a loan modification. And the bank would say, well, no, I didn't. And I would say, well, look at all the canceled checks that, that someone sent you. They didn't make up this, this uh, scenario. And uh, you're giving me an example of the common situation of a he said, she said, mm -hmm. because they never put these temporary loan mods in writing. In writing. They just say, here, start sending us this reduced amount. Absolutely. And we'll call it a temporary modification, and if you abide by that, we'll convert it to a permanent. Many people fell for that. Mm -hmm. And the banks are saying it's not in writing. We never even said to do it. Absolutely. They're saying it's not in writing, but now we have a, a number of court cases as well as our specific evidence we put together, not only in a small claims venue, but also in Superior and Federal Court to prove the banks wrong on this. And you have a way to do that, and you just mentioned it, the cancel checks. How cancel, does that show it? Cancel checks are a big item here because you have, in a lot of these cases, uh, you have foreclosure going on on during this period of time, and the bank doesn't foreclose. Why didn't they foreclose? They were supposed to because the victim or the homeowner was paying the money during this period of time, and they were paying them less than what was required on the regular mortgage. A bank wouldn't normally accept that unless they had agreed to accept it. Absolutely. Wow, we need an expert witness for that. <laughs> Isabel, you are yes. out there in the trenches helping people try to get loan modifications. Yes. But you're a grad student. Right. Is, is it voluntary? Is it research? What put you out in the well, field? Well, actually, um, it started out as this is my volunteerism um, that actually turned into my research. Um, so what I'm interested in is the actual experience of the foreclosure process because I feel that what gets overlooked um, many times when we discuss foreclosure is actually this is a traumatic life-changing experience that individuals go through and um, we're not so focused on that sometimes but we see these statistics that come out that foreclosure impacts your health um, in various ways but 
what I'm interested in is what is it in the foreclosure process that that causes you to have you know an increase in your blood pressure or depression or all these other or things. obesity or obesity <laughs> <laughs> I have no personal experience with that okay Hagen -Dazs. <laughs> <laughs> so Isabel you were out there gathering the personal stories a lot of people say you know what it people should just leave their home, either right. because accept that you can't pay and, and leave the home, that's what you agreed to, and right. you know, you fell out of terms, walk away from the home, right. or strategic foreclosure. You're upside down, the market's not gonna come back, just walk away and save yourself from being upside down. And it's not as easy as just leaving one rental and going to another rental when you've built your life around a home. That's right, a lot of these people have invested everything they've had built up over the years. I mean, their 401ks in the very beginning, and Alan probably knows this also, is that um, in the very beginning before the modifications were actually um, a resource for them, um, they were entering into forbearance agreements. Okay, where they and would, explain a forbearance briefly. So that's where you actually make this agreement with the bank that you'll catch the payments up in, in this amount of time. Like say, you'll increase your monthly payments by so much to make up for the deficit, the payments that you're behind over a six month period. Okay. So what ends up happening is they deplete their 401k because you can actually access your 401k in times of hardship to save your home. So now, they, they do that, they've depleted their 401k, they've actually um, been living off their credit cards and you know, just for food and, and sustenance. Um, so at the end of the process, they end up losing their home because they can, it's not sustainable home ownership. Right, yes, and you know, we just have to frame this as in a normal economy, somebody let's say they lose their job and they can't afford to maintain the payments and they get a temporary forbearance and then they haven't made it up so they lose their home, they can go out and get other employment. But in this market, so many people had loans that they could handle, suddenly found their job market wiped out, right. they can't go get another job easily, and through no fault of their own, they've lost their down payment, they've lost their 401k, they're upside down on their home, right. they've, they're going to be credit wipeout, yes. and then they go to get a rental, and what do they want to know? What's your employment? Mm, absolutely. I want to run a credit check. Right. Very traumatizing. Right. Tell us the t statistics, Alan. Overall, what's the big picture? How well has the mortgage modification worked? Well, I had to do some uh, current research again. You always want to say somewhat current before I came on the show. Uh, right now, uh, the Home Affordable Modification Program, HAMP, which is the major program, um, you have a 30% chance of getting a loan modification if you apply. Uh, statistically speaking, numbers-wise, uh, there was roughly about 190 uh, or 1 million 900,000 applicants, at least in a loan uh, um, procedure. There has less than 500,000 at this time actively in it in, in a permanent loan modification, and the uh, government accounting office estimates that 50% of those out of the 500,000 will default within the next 36 months. So it's a small number for whom long-term success is realized. Yes, and, and we started these programs saying we need 31% of your income, mm -hmm. and that's a big thing because, you know, people now we're, we're, we're forced to put their taxes and insurance and, and their monthly house payment in that 31%. Right. And then what happens after a period of time, then we have a back end, what they call a ramp up on these loan modifications. It can go up to 70% of your income. Uh, nobody can sustain 70% of their could, income could, for no. the home loan. No. Why isn't it working for most people, though? Uh, Is it the wrong people getting it? Uh, they try to blanket everybody to get it because you want to try to put everybody in, 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 in uh, have the opportunities to do it. Like the same people want an opportunity for everybody to get the original home loan. Uh, a lot of these home loans were bad home loans. You, they, you could never sustain the original loan in the first place. And then as time 
progressed, the, you had to start paying the real mortgage, not just interest. And then you were forced to say, well, I need a loan modification. And without a principal reduction, right. and that's the key, the principal reduction of the mortgage, most of these home loans have been failing. So what you're saying is that people want to see the value of their loan decrease to match the decrease in the value of their house. Absolutely. And the banks are not doing that. No, they're they're not. lowering the payments, but they're just backloading all of that extra amount you're upside down. Absolutely. Um, sorry, that's just a tough position to be in. So do you stay? If you get offered a modification that you can afford, monthly payments, and the indexing up is not terrible, do you stay upside down and hope that you'll stay in the house long term and the market will go back up? Will it go back up? Well, I have to speak as a real estate appraiser also because that's one of my, my other talents. Markets go up and down, but you can be in a position that you're, that you're not going to see relief for a number of years. What's acceptable to people? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, so when you look at what's acceptable, it has to be based on a financial decision that will cover what your family needs, what your intentions are going to be when you retire, if you're going to move to different areas. And that has to be included in whether or not a loan modification, you're staying at that specific location, will make sense for you. I think it depends, too, on the individual. If, if they're considering you know, it as a future investment. But a lot of times these people are um, investing emotionally in their home also. It's not just a matter of right dollars on. and cents that they really feel like this was their their opportunity to actually um, enter into that or to achieve that American dream of home ownership that is so um, weaved into the fa fabric of what it means to be middle class and successful. And also, Isabel, isn't it true that we were told that if we could get a home it's the safest investment possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Historically, the, yes. The real estate market goes up and down, but really what goes up and down is the speed of appreciation. Sure. It never declines. No. I mean, no, you look at that chart net, from like yes. 2000, I'm sorry, 1950 to 2008. It's up, 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 and then in 2007, crash. Right. So if you, if you got in, you were good. And, right. And a lot of people were blocked out, were they not? Absolutely, yeah. Tell us what, what techniques were used to block out specific groups out of home ownership. Historically? Yes. Oh, yes. We have the practice of redlining, which we know was a racist practice where um, you were not allowed to have a loan if you were, you know, a mini minority. Um, this has been, you know, documented. Um, throughout the years. And then you have racial steering. But so we have all these. What is racial steering? Um, where you're actually, if you're going to buy and you're of, say, African-American uh, race, you are, the um, realtor actually tells you it's better for you to buy in this neighborhood as opposed to this neighborhood that was predominantly white, right, and where you have the chance of um, actually building, you know, substantial equity in your home. And the housing bubble kind of relaxed those restrictions and made Absolutely. it possible to get in so we for have, all groups. We mm -hmm. have what you call reverse redlining. So instead of excluding these low income or middle income minorities from home ownership, you're targeting them for the demand for these subprime predatory loans. That's right. Was that good or bad at the time? That was absolutely bad because yeah. it's not sustainable home ownership. When you, when you give these people loans and you don't address um, other factors such as not having the same access to wages or jobs or education, um, in the long run, it, the home ownership is not sustainable. You have to address the structural. Let me, uh, Alan, I, I get a word in, then we gotta go to a okay. call. Yes. And also, the, uh, um, during this period of time, uh, from 2002, 3, 4, 5, and 6, what was sustainable was people were able to refinance because right. the prices were going up. And that's yes. what took advantage of many minorities because people say you could still afford the right. home. Right, because the prices were skyrocketing right. during the bubble. Mm -hmm. So even if it leveled out and slowed down a little bit, you could still refi before any that's right. big increases happened. Absolutely. And, and that was kind of a promise that wasn't ridiculous to, to believe. 
But everybody seemed to be getting rich except you, the non-homeowner at the time. So you had to get in, right. or you were the only one left behind. It was but, like the IPO. But bubble. in a court setting, it was irresponsible for the real estate professionals yes. to, to offer that because they broke something called a fiduciary duty. I could not ever sell you a home that you could never ultimately pay long term for. Yeah, I don't know many salespeople that abide by that fiduciary duty. Well, the, well, Obviously not. But that's against the it's law. The buyer. Okay, good point. I'm going to go to Peter of Moreno Valley. Welcome, Peter. You're on the air. Hi, thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, if my lender orders an appraisal, does that mean that my loan will be approved? Oh, good question. Okay, so lender wants an appraisal. Is that a good sign? Uh, it's a necessary sign. It doesn't mean that, that uh, it means that uh, if they're doing everything in parallel, it's just part of the process. If they approved everything up to that point, that could be the last thing that's needed before your loan is approved. So it's a good sign. It's, it's nothing to, to take to the bank, excuse the pun, mm -hmm. but it's a good sign. And, and what I would take from that, actually, is that they're at least not ignoring the loan process. The stories that I heard so much about, and I personally experienced also, is through the application process, you would have these weekly appointments to call in and update about what your job status is, what your mm -hmm. income level mm -hmm. is, send me financial paperwork, and then the next week they would say, I, I don't have the paperwork, sure. or it's the, the three-week-old version, it's out of date, you'll have yes. to send it again before I can act. At least getting the appraisal means they're, they're moving on it. They're moving along. Okay, so, and you're an appraisal, although I know you do a lot more high-end commercial work than real estate but you're aware of that market. Uh, is there a lot of, well, what's happening in the market right now? Tell us. Uh, well, you hear a lot of macroeconomics, which takes national statistics, and, and they try to apply that locally to your microeconomics, which is in your neighborhood. So if I was to tell you what's happening locally, I just did a litigation work in Ukaipa in a specific area, and that neighborhood had 70% of all the sales during a last three months period of time that was either short sales or foreclosures. So it really depends upon your neighborhood. And, and who's buying those homes. And who's buying the homes are investors. Yes. Oh, I have heard something about that. Help us understand this process. Well, there's a, we both can talk of that, so let's, uh, the investors right now are large uh, corporate investors. They could be multinationals, they could be from other countries, they could be syndicates, not a bad syndicates, but put together syndicates, and they're buying blocks of homes. And basically what, they, what their price is, is what is equated into what the uh, rental value is on a neighborhood. In other words, if people are paying for a three bedroom, two bath, apartment or house, $1,900 a month, that $1,900 if I'm buying a property equates into roughly around $300,000. That's enough to pay for the mortgage, insurance, and taxes that the renter has to pay back to the investor. And that's what's holding the prices specifically. So if the rental market doesn't have an inflationary effect, then the housing prices won't go up because investors won't buy those houses if they have to pay more than they can get in rental. Absolutely. So I've actually um, heard a different scenario on that also, where we actually have investors coming in and getting into bidding wars. So what we, which is really scary because then we start to see this artificial bubble in Absolutely. the real estate market already starting to inflate because as they bid for, they're coming in with cash. Big cash, $300,000. Right. Uh, and they're buying in blocks. So right. They're bringing in. They're buying them in blocks. Uh, um, and they're also, when we think about the average Joe homeowner, they're actually being priced out of the market. Because, um, well, yeah. Alan probably knows that. The house won't appraise for that. It won't appraise. But That's you can get around that by coming with cash. You can okay. get around with cash. But again, you, you do have an artificial market that's being generated by, by uh, the investors. Okay, backing up. Uh -huh. You get around it by coming in with cash because you don't have to, no, nobody cares about an appraisal if nobody, you don't need a loan. No, that's right. Absolutely right. But investors, some, investors sometimes are not that educated in what they're investing in. They're also are going to be caught when they can't get the right rent to pay off their investment. Right. And then it's the whole cycle goes back down again. Okay. Tell us about what got you into this field? Um, back in the summer of 2008, 
um, just all my friends and neighbors were starting to lose their house, wow. actually. So I started looking into uh, to see what I could do and actually talking to the banks and saying, hey, what can we do? What, how can uh, you um, avail so, uh, some kind of assistance to them? And that's how I learned about loan modifications before the actual Obama program was in place. So, um, what level of success did you have before the Obama program? Um, some, a lot of it, it was like this uh, really elaborate, elaborate formula that you had to figure out because the thing is, th this is the most insidious part about this whole thing is that uh, most of the homeowners were actually paying mortgage insurance. So it had to be profitable for the bank to actually uh, modify the home. Otherwise, if it was more profitable for them to foreclose, then they chose that option because the uh, mortgage insurance company would pay them the Did deficit. the Obama program help? And the Obama program, by the way, that's the HAMP program, yes? Yes. yes. Did the Obama program help? It did. It was a really long, arduous process where, like you were talking about, um, there was a lot of bureaucracy involved, a lot of paperwork that, that got lost, supposedly, in the process, um, and actually was an excuse for not doing the modification yeah, because they never received it. I think every homeowner understands that that's the game. Sure. But I think that um, one of the most positive experiences I had was actually working um, with individuals that were um, utilizing the NACA program where what they did is they streamlined the mortgage process by actually getting um, everybody into one room. Like you would have the homeowners NACA would help them process the paperwork, put it up into the system. And in the same room, in the same weekend, you had um, mortgage representatives that were authorized to make decisions on modifications. So you could actually potentially leave that weekend with a modification on your mortgage. And did that work it for people? It absolutely did work in many, many circumstances. Okay. Was that a good idea or is strategic foreclosure the way to go, Alan? Uh, again, strategic foreclosure, and let's look at strategic foreclosure, should you just walk away from your home? And does it make financial sense to you? You have a guilt scenario sure. that people look at. You also have a They're, financial... They need to be good to their word. That's they, the guilt yes. issue. You also have a uh, financial uh, uh, scenario here that people are not educated that they're going to be paying more for their loan after a loan modification. The government comes out 95 percent. You're kidding me. No. You're saying that after a loan mod that's supposed to reduce your payment, they're going to wind up ultimately paying more. Yes. Con uh, Congress, uh, uh, I was reading some congressional uh, testimony and it was 95 percent of all loan modifications, the homeowner is paying more for their loan by doing a loan modification than not doing it because you've got front end and back end loading mm -hmm. uh, of the loan. Okay, so what I'm hearing is the banks made a bundle of money by starting the bubble, packaging all these subprimes into CDOs and selling them overseas. Yes. Yes. Then when it burst, they still got their bonuses and no prosecutions. Mm -hmm. Now they're backing the investors so that they can help fund and benefit from the appreciation in the now foreclosed homes. Absolutely. Plus, their adherence to the loan modification is going to ultimately pay them even more dividends. No downside for the bank anywhere? No. No. All right. I, that's the way our system works. Hey, great to have you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind the viewers. Hey, viewers, this is a live show. If you want to ask a question about the situation you're in or tell us, were you successful? Were you not? Have you lost your home? Have you been able to keep it? I want to hear from you. Email us at questions at pluggedinland.org or go to pluggedinland.org, fill out the Ask the Guest form, send it on in, or call us and we'll put you on the air. Isabel, tell us about the personal stories. You witnessed one. You've actually gone to the foreclosure auctions. I, I have um, uh, actually accompanied some of um, the foreclosed homeowners, but I actually um, went to this one foreclosure auction, and I met a, a woman there with her son, and um, she had actually told me that she was in the process of negotiating the modification with the bank, but for some reason, some glitch in the system, the, for, uh, the auction wasn't postponed. 
which is probably familiar to you. Um, so her house was auctioned that day and she actually showed up that day to beg the new owners of her home if she could stay in her home for a couple more months while her son um, graduated from high school because she didn't want his education disrupted. And during the course of our conversation, um, she just broke down and, and began to tell me what a traumatic, all-encompassing experience this has been, the foreclosure process. And to reach the point where all of that work and effort and you're watching your home get sold right in front of you. Right in front and of you. And you then have to go back. That, wow. Yeah, it's really heartbreaking. All right, I'm going to jump over to another caller. This is a caller named, I don't know your name, so you're going to have to tell us your name, what city you're from, and what's your question. You're on the air. Um, hi, is that, it, am I on the air? Yes, you are. What's your name? Oh, my name is Fred, calling from Ventura County, Camarillo. Great, thank you, Fred. What's your question? Well, I wanted to ask, uh, I'm kind of caught uh, the later part of the show. Uh, uh, can I ask a question about refinancing on a, um, on a rental? Ask away. We probably may or may not be able to answer it, but feel free to ask. Just make it somewhat terse for us. Okay. Um, I've, uh, I've got four rentals, and all the... Uh, all the uh, interest on them are uh, close to 7%, and it seems like because I have the rentals, I don't qualify for um, getting them refied because they say I have too much debt. Good so question. So any way to get around that? Yeah, good question. Alan, do you know, can you speak to that? Well, on the rentals, when I have to appraise rentals, we mainly look at uh, two aspects of it is a rental income. I mean, I mean, if your rental income has been going down, that, that's what you really have to submit to the bank. A lot of these programs are private programs that they have for rental properties. And it's, uh, you just have to present a good package that the value of the property with your leases will continue to grow and you have to do a really good analysis on it. Uh, so you can get that refinance, but it's mainly a private uh, mm -hmm. uh, market on that that's offered by the banks on, on, on the rental properties. So let me just be clear, though. You're familiar with the HAMP program. In that case, it has to be a primary residence, doesn't it, for it to get modified under the, uh, uh, the Freddie, uh, under, see, the Freddie Mac, uh, under the Fannie HAMP program, Mae right. right. So would he, it would just be bank voluntary. It would be bank, it would be a private uh, 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 refinance program that they would have to the bank, the bank. And if one bank wouldn't do it, try to go to different banks with your rental income and your perspective on, on, your, on your analysis on that. It, it, he would have to prove that he has at least 20% equity. If he's upside down, then um, yeah, it's not a good shot for him to get refinanced. Yeah. And to be able to qualify for the new um, refinance program, the HARP, um, it would have to be your primary residence. Yeah. Okay, and the HARP is for people that main they are current. They maintain right. their payments. Right, and it's a primary residence for the HARP program. Right. And on these rental programs, it's, it's all specifically to, to your lender, mm -hmm. and it's a private modification that they would do. All right, I'm going to go to another caller. So from Palm Springs, we're going to talk to Jerry. Jerry, you're on the air. What's your question? Home mod in progress. And I have my, my TV set turned down, so I don't know if I'm echoing. But um, I've done my three trial payments with Bank of America, mm -hmm. three additional trial payments. I'm getting robocalls, sign your document, your permanent loan mod has been approved, have not received it. Mm -hmm. But the biggest issue that I'm wondering, I, I ha actually have equity in my home. So my, the original note was for three hundred on a $420,000 house, which is about uh, valued at three forty dollars to three forty-five dollars now. And I only owe about two seventy on the principal. Okay. So and what they told me at Bank of America is that they're going to do this loan mod for forty years. I yes. just now, I, but I haven't gotten the paperwork. I don't know what to expect. It's all a big mystery. So, Jerry, did I hear you correctly that 
you're getting the automated calls from B of A saying sign your permanent modification, but you actually haven't yes. received a modification in the mail. No, it's supposed to be FedEx. Okay, well, that's actually a much better story than most of the people that never get paperwork. Alan, what would you say to that? Or Isabel, if you want to jump in. Go ahead, Isabel. Well, um, I was thinking, uh, the question that came to mind is, um, what is her financial situation um, that they want to give her a 40-year uh, mortgage? Normal, a, normal HAMP mods are 40-year. They take from 30 to 40 to help you reduce the payments. They, they do a, a payment right. restriction on it. Uh, or they do a, uh, interest, a lower interest over 40 years, even though you're paying more money after 40 years. Right. Uh, but on this, uh, you want to try to get a hold of the bank in writing. Uh, as it stands right now in 2013, you should have a one point of contact. You should, you should have it in writing, certified mail. Uh, also check to see if your house is up for any foreclosure at the current time. And uh, go ahead and stay really on top of it because it sounds like you're almost through with the process. Well, what? Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No. What I was going to, what I would suggest to her is that instead of doing a modification where it actually extends the life of the loan, if she actually has that much equity in her home, she should consider doing a regular refi. Where because she's actually one of the few people that are absolutely it that makes no sense to do down. the modification right. with all these other stipulations. Well, but was she late that? or anything else? It well, depends that, upon uh, what the HARP right, program right. will do for. Her. If she oh. was late, then okay, I will let you know. Uh, this touched me personally. My wife and I, right before the bubble burst, we had a home with equity. We then put it up for sale. It got sold. We moved to a new ho home, nice home, and put a big down payment on it, and felt we were we were great. We use B of A. The purchase of our old home fell through because the bubble burst and the lender that was loaning the buyer just went out of business. Mm -hmm. In a one week time, they were out of business. And so that sale went through. Nobody else would buy it because there were no loan backed for buyers then. And so we wound up with a rental. It got foreclosed on. I went through that traumatic process mm -hmm. and we tried saving our new primary home, lost all the equity, of course. And I would use B of A, and it took us a year of excruciating weekly negotiations. Mm -hmm. And then one day, suddenly, we got a FedEx, and there was the permanent mod. And I accepted it. Of course. I calculated that even with the ups, it about broke even, but it certainly helped us immediately, and I saved my home from B of A. Well, so the FedEx may in. arrive. Yeah. So, Jerry, good luck with that. I'm going to go to another call because we have many. Let's go to uh, Torrance. Ann, you're on the air. What's your question, Ann? Um, hi, it's not a question. I just want to share my experience, which is uh, I have I have an investment property, but it's a fourplex. A and fourplex, okay. And under the Fed Bank, you can refinance under the HARP program. I want to share that with the caller who just asked that question, because I want to do this illustration, thinking that because this investment property, I'm not qualified for HARP. That's incorrect. Wow. Okay, that's not what I had heard. But if you've done it, then you're our expert for this mo yeah. for this show, um, and that's a good signal to not just uh, go on this information, but definitely find out if you can get that qualification, that qualification to get that modification on an investment property. Thank you, Ann. I appreciate your clarification. And let's go out to another call in Simi Valley. I know your your eyebrows are going up. You probably have much more you want to say. Simi Valley, Marcella, you're on the air. What's your question? Yeah, my question is, I have an FHA loan, okay, and I want to refinance to um, lower my payment. Okay. But when I try with the bank, they tell me that uh, I have to come up with money out front, and I don't have that. Yeah, we, we both did the same head tilt, huh? Yeah. FHA? I don't think so. There could be some money for a closing cost or something, but you know, have them tell you exactly what the money is going to be used for. Is I didn't experience any any out of pocket. Okay. I I was told make trial payments, uh -huh. made them all pristine, and then uh, an absolutely zero out of pocket permanent uh -huh. mod came in. FHA means it should fall under the HARP program because it's a government entity backed, right. and as as far as I know, Marcel, the HARP program mods are going to be no cost. Are they not 
Are they trying to exclude her from that and go into some I bank? I think what I heard her say is that it was a finance, refinance. So this if she's going for a straight refinance, yeah. there could be closing there, costs. There could be closing costs oh, and stuff for, for a refinance, yeah. absolutely. Marcella, are you still on the air? I thought she was trying to refinance as in trying to get a loan mod. No, but no. if you're saying, no, okay. If I don't need a loan mod. I, all I need refinance. is to lower my payment. Oh, if you're just refinancing, yeah, I would expect you're right, Alan. There could be some closing costs involved in that right. unless they want to wrap those closing costs in your refinance. Well, before the bubble burst, people refinanced all the time because they were getting so much equity in their home. Absolutely. And there was always some closing costs. Right. You paid some points out of pocket. And they would you, wrap those closing costs sometimes into that second loan, into that refinance. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they can do it nowadays. Good question. Thank you very much, Marcella. I hope that helped a little. Um, <laughs> you have talked to so many people that have gone through this kind of a, a foreclosure process. What do you do to help them with a soft landing? What helps them get over the trauma? Mm. That's a difficult question, honestly. Um, I mean, for me, helping them uh, through the moving process itself. Um, Literally the move, like the, the U-Haul. I actually mm -hmm. help them with the yeah. U-Haul. That's true. Oh, that would be and the lowest point of their lives. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it is disheartening. You know, you would like to think that a lot of people do get over it, but I think it's a process. They don't initially. They probably haven't. Foreclosure is so tr such a life-altering experience. It actually becomes a point of reference in their life. There's life before foreclosure, and then there's life after foreclosure. Yes. So, um, I don't know. There's a, that, that is a difficult question, but I, I am there to, for support and to help them find the resources that they need. Okay. Another thing I want to talk about, Alan, this is going to get right to the heart of what you have done and why you've been on the show before. You wrote the book about it. So I'm going to hold up a book. Let's see if you can catch this. It is, get it above the lower third there. And it is How to Sue Your Bank. It's called Sue Your Bank, written by Alan Sims. Alan, why did you write a book saying Sue Your Bank? Uh, this book was written for all the people who were affected for the loan modifications. Basically, if they applied uh, for a loan modification, they were in a trial loan modification, they paid money to the bank, and then all of a sudden they were foreclosed on after they were promised they were going to get a loan. That happens. I, happens I mean, all the time. Right, all the time. And the end solution for it is they get mad. What happens? I can't go to a district attorney. I can't go to a private attorney. I can't. I, I can't go to the attorney general to get resolution on this. So I came up with a different alternative. And what you will read in this book is actual tr court transcripts where we prove fraud against Bank of America in a small claims case. And small claims now, you can go up to ten thousand dollars. That's not and, bad. And, and a lot of people on these loan modifications, their trial payments are below that, or, yeah. or a little bit more than what they paid to the bank. Mm -hmm. They can also request the court, the small claims court, to review the credit that was damaged during this period of time. The banks should have been reporting as full payments during a loan modification they were reporting as partial payments. Because it wasn't the original amount, it was a lowered amount. Absolutely. But it was the full amount requested of the loan. Absolutely. Model. And that, and when you say, well, what's the difference? It could be 100 points on your credit that could be corrected that's because huge. of that. That's a big, that's a big Especially number. when you're out without your house trying to, to rebuild a life. So how much does it cost someone? Well, of course, they have to go out and, and, and buy a book, okay. But it's going to cost them $75 if they're going to go after that big $10,000 uh, 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 claim against the bank, and if you can't even afford going to court, let's say you're, 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 you don't have the resources, you can get a fee waiver and you can go to court for free. How much is your book on Amazon? I think it's like $8.90. Okay, so for $85. No, 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 $8.90. All right, so I'm rounding. Oh, okay. <laughs> $85. I thought you said 85 bucks. I said, no, no, no. no, no. $85, <laughs> you can get the how-to and the fee to sue your bank. Absolutely. But the how-to is also going to tell you whether or not it's the right circumstance, because not every circumstance is right. No, no, you, you have to be able to, during this loan modification, to be paying the bank something. Right. And, and it's a fresh start. That's what people really want. They want money to, even their, to go to the U-Haul, it seems like. Right. They're in so much of a hawk situation. And it, I didn't know in the last three years that 
challenging as far as the litigation aspect of it, proving points in court, but the personal aspects sure. that came along with it, it, it has really made me humble about uh, uh, a lot of people don't really realize that this, this yeah. problem. We have to get to a couple of other callers. Before I do, I just want to mention, I'm plugging the book in part because I know that you self-funded your nonprofit. You didn't make a lot of money. Eventually, the nonprofit was replaced by the book. What I'm saying is you weren't out to try to be one of those people that take advantage of all of these people's unfortunate circumstances and make money by promising something. If only they paid you $1,500 no. or something like that. No. You actually were out there kind of on a limb, and you were the first one to successfully sue B of A yes, in I the was. civil court. And you can see us on YouTube, uh, my, uh, my client, Dave, and you, can re you have the real transcripts there where Bank of America admits they're only trained to take the money. All right, let's go to a call. I'm going to go out to somewhere, Cecilia. Cecilia, <laughs> you're on the air. Hello? What's your question, Cecilia? Hi. Um, my, my question is, uh, actually, I've been through a really long process, uh, five years with the bank. Um, I've gone through everything that homeowners have gone through, and the last reason to will be to modify my job, but I'm, I'm a laid-up teacher. And so I was retraining. I went to Keep Your Home, California, with the crew, and I'm just scared that they won't accept the employment offer when I do get a new job with the career. So, okay. So you know. Yes, Cecilia, what I gathered, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, and you're from Los Angeles, I think, yes. is that you lost your job, you've been training for another career, so you don't really qualify for a home modification because you're, you're not gainfully employed, but you've been training and you will be gainfully employed and you want to know if you'll qualify at that time. Is that your question? Right, and, and I do owe about $500,000 on a probably $200,000 home at the back of five years. Okay, so with that, let's turn it over to What's your recommendation? Give me yours first, Isabel. I think that they actually will work with you if you're unemployed. Um, she says that, uh, if I heard right, she's been in the modification process for five years. That's what I thought I heard. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so clearly they do work with you if you're unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as long as she can uh, prove that she has gainful employment and um, she meets the guidelines of income, the 31% target. Yeah, that's um, what so many people have done is they've had to retrain for a new career. Right. Absolutely. And they had a, uh, they still have an unemployment program during this period of time. Right. They might even have a, a forbearance that program while you're retrained. But again, it's the bottom line again. How much income will you make on your new job to pay that $500,000 note? Okay. I need to get to the next subject, so I'm going to go right now to settlement checks. We have been hearing about people getting money in the mail. Are we all getting money in the mail? Are we getting thousands of dollars? Are, are, are we getting our house for free? What is happening with this big national settlement? I have not heard one One thing about get it. a check. Well, <laughs> about two weeks ago, one of my clients got a $500 check. They were a little bit incensed, and they, that same day they went out and sued the bank. Okay. Okay. Uh, re recently, I'm usually not incensed from a $500 uh, well, check arriving in my in my mailbox. Uh, uh, recently, uh, this was all due to the robo signing mm -hmm. that we have out there. The the foreclosure procedures were not followed exactly. Today, there's like 300,000 California residents. This was in the paper. Uh, Associated Press uh, picked it up. Uh, were supposedly getting a $1,500 check. Now, this check doesn't mean that this is a settlement, per se, uh, and you can't sue for any other damages. It just, it's the solution that the attorney generals have came up with, working with the banks, our national settlement, and the feds, to give you something for this wrongful foreclosure that was done to you. Okay, so a couple quick questions about that. One, can everybody expect $1,500? I do not know when that will happen. I don't know if they filled in the form that they were supposed to fill in to apply for that. There was a special agency that, that they had to fill in a form right. about a year ago. I, I read most people get three to $500. That's what most people were getting. But, uh, but I, it's up to the people who filled in that form in that deadline. I think the deadline was in December. 
that they had to fill it in right. of 2012. And they had to say, my bank mistreated me and I want a free home and they didn't get a free home. Uh, Should whatever, they get a free home? What is, how bad is robo signing? Well, again, robo signing only is a procedural foreclosure problem. It's a procedure. It wasn't followed. It doesn't mean that you're not obligated to still pay your mortgage. You had to pay your mortgage. And there were scams going out trying to tell people you can get a free house. Mm -hmm. And that just didn't happen. And a lot of it was spearheaded by attorneys. Who said since they they didn't follow the procedure, they didn't find who had the note. Wasn't that, how would you characterize that? Well, we, we call it in my industry finding Waldo. You know, Waldo, the, the comic book, or yeah. the little guy you're trying to find him in the haystack. A lot of times these procedures would go to the court mm -hmm. and the court would then ask, well, the judge would say, okay, I need a tender. I need payment from you like you're paying the bank while this uh, is adjudicated. And that's when the homeowner will find out, well, I can't afford to pay you anything. And then the judge will say, I'm sorry, your house has to be foreclosed on. And, and that's where it so went to problems. where the note was, because it was packaged up and sold as a CDO Absolutely. typically, who actually had the note versus who was the servicer? Not proper, but a minor issue in the big picture. Absolutely. So you got minor compensation for the minor issue. Absolutely, because there was no other damages. That was the ultimate solution. If you're, if that was so grievous that you had a $300,000 damage to your house, and in California you need to have equity in a home to get real damages from the loss of the home. If there's no equity and you lose it, then you haven't lost any real value, any Absolutely. net worth. Absolutely. Okay, I've got to go to another call. Tim, thank you for your patience. Out in Orange County, welcome to the show. You're on the air. What's your question? Hi, I purchased my home five years ago um, with 100% financing, so no down. It's currently still underwater, roughly 20%. My income has gone up, thankfully, um, over the past few years. But I'm wondering if there are any options available to me um, to refi or try to get my rate down. Is it not a Fannie and Freddie service loan? Tim, you confused me on one thing, and that is you said you paid 100%, 100% of the 20% down, or, or you had a loan there somewhere, mm -hmm. yes? Uh, no down, 100% financing. Oh, I got that. I'm 80, sorry. 80-20. So instead of an 80-20, they financed the whole thing 100%, and he's underwater now. What can he do? Uh, if he has tried to refinance, he might be able to qualify for one of the, now we're at HARP 2 programs. I don't know exactly what that is, if he hasn't missed any payments. But that's something he should have to explore whether he He can. said his income is in, in increasing, which Absolutely. means that he's one of the many Southern California people who experienced a degradation of income right. during the collapse of the bubble. Again, the refinance doesn't mean he's going to draw money out of it. It means, right. it means he's going to restructure the loan. It's right. really a restructuring of the loan that he can possibly do. Under With his hand. increase in, in income, though, he's going to be amongst the more viable candidates for that loan, won't he be? Absolutely. So possibly good prognosis for Tim. Maybe, yes. Good luck, Tim. We wish you the best on that. Tell me why some of these banks have been winding up in superior court cases, not civil courts. Well, for me personally, I wind up in federal and superior court with some of these cases because of the loss of damages to, to the homeowner. If there is a si sizable down payments, if we could prove uh, a, a fraudulent activity on the bank at the time, uh, some banks would say, look, I want you to pay off the second loan uh, that you have on a house. And somebody coughed up a $60,000 check, and then within two weeks, they went ahead and foreclosed on the home, those are the type of cases that I have in, on, on my plate currently. I have one minute. I want to ask you one last question, and that is somebody has been paying their payments on time the whole time. They bought their house before the bubble collapse. They did what many people did. They put a second because, hey, why not take money out of all that great equity the bubble created? And the second is one of those that had a, a balloon at 10 years, and it's coming up on 10 years but now they're upside down. What can they do to not have to pay this giant balloon on their second and not get foreclosed on by the second? We talked about that. Yeah. Well, go ahead, you would like to answer Well, that? Um, basically the second won't foreclose because they're in second position. So they would actually have to pay off the first in order to collect their money. 
the, fir um, the first mortgage always gets the proceeds first, and then what's left over goes. So to since the they're second. upside down, it's actually against their best interest to foreclose as the Absolutely. second. Absolutely. Absolutely. So they're going to negotiate. They're, Absolutely. They will negotiate. Yeah. They might be playing hardball over the phone, but they're going to negotiate when it comes to brass tacks. Absolutely. Right. Okay, I have one final question. How is Tom Arnold doing? Tom Arnold? You remind me of Roseanne Barr. <gasps> that's um, the second time I've heard yes. that this week. And that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank my guests, that Alan Sims amazing. and Isabel Pren Roseanne Barr Placentia. <laughs> thank you for coming to the studio and enlightening our audience on the reality of this very difficult crisis. Plugged Inland is going on a short hiatus, so there won't be a live show next week, but I look forward to rejoining you in the near future. I'm Roger Bowman. I hope you have enjoyed watching Plugged Inland. We'll see you again. <laughs>